become a regular forum for asking the talented and experienced leaders from a broad range of local firms to share their thoughts on high performance growth strategies, not only for the coming year, but for the years ahead. I like to think of manufacturing as the soul of Chicago. It's what initially put our city on the business map and laid the foundation for the diverse regional economy we have today. Cranes has been covering your industry for more than 30 years, watching and reporting as the manufacturing sector has evolved. We view this as an unprecedented time of opportunity for manufacturers as they seize new markets, new technologies, and a new public awareness of the importance of manufacturing to the nation's economy. Now, we're not the only people excited about the future of manufacturing in Chicago. This morning, we are joined by a group of outstanding sponsors who have a laser focus on meeting the needs of manufacturing companies. We're honored to be joined by representatives from our three co-sponsors, MB Financial Bank, Prescient Solutions, and Shepherd Moscow, as well as our presenting sponsor, Grant Thornton. I'd like to take a moment to introduce representatives from these organizations and give you a chance to thank them. When I say their name, please stand so everyone can see you. From our co-sponsor, MB Financial, we have Ed Malefchik, who is Executive Vice President of Commercial Banking and a Director of the Bank. Ed, please stand. For more than 100 years, MB Financial has been providing financial solutions based on the relationships it has with Chicago manufacturers and the middle market business community. In addition to the bank's wide range of commercial and personal banking products and services, it has a wealth management division that offers trust, private banking, and investments. This combination has helped MB Financial reach more than $10 billion in assets. Ed has 27 years of experience, and as he explains, MB Financial success comes from the philosophy that we treat our customers better by delivering a high level of personalized service. From Prescient Solutions, please welcome Jerry Irvine, who is Chief Information Officer and Executive Vice President of Sales. Jerry. <laughs> Prescient Solutions is one of the premier information technology outsourcing companies in the Chicago area. Jerry and his team are not your average computer geeks. They become an extension of their client's business and help to maneuver those companies through the IT landscape. Prescient offers specialized products that do more than create stable and secure IT environments. They work, their work also leads to greater productivity and reliability while decreasing, by decreasing total cost of ownership. As a quick side note, Jerry serves on the National Cyber Technology Task Force, which advises federal decision makers on cyber technology policy. From our third co-sponsor, Shepard Moscow, we're pleased to have Johnny Kelleher, who is a partner. From its start in 1970, Shepherd Moscow has grown into a global firm that focuses on organization development consulting. It specializes in developing leaders who can deliver results in complex businesses. The company takes two approaches to this. It consults with leaders to help them respond to the real issues underlying their business challenges. And then it designs and delivers experiential leadership programs that create learning experiences to help them become global leaders. While Johnny leads the operation in Chicago, Shepherd Moscow also has partners in Dublin and London. Its clients span the globe and include household names such as Allstate, Ford Motor Company, Kellogg's, and Stryker. Please again, Johnny, thank you for being with us. Now it's my pleasure to call to the podium Jim Maurer from our presenting sponsor, Grant Thornton. Jim is an audit partner as well as Chicago office practice leader for consumer and industrial products. Grant Thornton, which has its headquarters here, is one of the world's leading organizations of independently owned and, management, and managed accounting and consulting firms. 
These firms offer assurance, tax, and specialized business advice to privately held businesses and public companies. It's more than 2,600 partners provide clients with distinctive, high-quality service in over 100 companies. Jim has spent the last 25 years working with entrepreneurial, high-growth companies in manufacturing, distribution, and retail. While he currently heads the Chicago office's consumer and industrial products practice, Jim recently completed a five-year stint as the national managing partner in this area. In addition to providing audit services to his clients, Jim has advised companies on general business issues, including mergers and acquisitions, strategic planning, and process improvement. And he continues to be the lead facilitator for clients who are doing strategic planning. Please welcome me in joining Jim Maurer to the podium. Thanks, David. It's, uh, as David mentioned, it's year three, and it's been a great three years. David, first, I want to thank your team. Uh, it has been, it's, this is the premier event in Chicago for manufacturing. I mean, just take a quick look around the room. This room is full, and I think we turned people away. So congratulations to your team, and thank you all for coming. I've been standing up here three years in front of probably a lot of the same people. And the, last year, we talked about growth. The, the interesting thing, I gave you a little insight as to what we were seeing in our clients' boardrooms. And everybody last year had on their agenda, we are going to double in size. Now, it might have been three years, might have been five years, but we're going to double in size. Well, those boardrooms this year, and we're still talking about growth, but we're talking about it just a little bit differently. We want to make sure it's pretty profitable. Uh, profitable growth is where everybody's, it's where we're spending time. It's been the main topic. There's a lot of uncertainty out there. We were just talking about it as our table. We've got the fiscal cliff right in front of us. You've got China slowdown. The interesting th thing in China, we've got some slowdown, but you've got some ramping up in some segments and some companies trying to do it at the same time. You've also got the European crisis. We've got an automotive slowdown. They've been running pretty good. They still got backlog, but what's happening is the suppliers are starting to see the backlog soften. So this is going to be a very challenging 2013. I think we're all hearing just a little bit of caution. We're all hearing pulling back a little bit on the capital spend. Well, in that situation, I wanted to share with you today probably the best piece of business advice I have ever gotten. You're, you're going you're gonna to have to take notes. So you do have. You, I'm not kidding, because if you don't take notes, then when you're going to be so impressed when you're done, you're going to turn to the person next to you and say, can I copy that? You've got a purple book in front of you, happens to be a Grant Thornton book. Pull that out. Not really, I do. I want to see you reach down. Get that book. You're going to want to write this down. There we go. The, the best piece of advice I got, I still use today, is manage your R. And that's the letter R. Manage your R. Now, you're not going to understand this if you don't write this down. Now, I want you to write this equation down. E plus R equals O. Here's the important part. Event plus response equals outcome. Manage your R. How well you manage your R determines how successful you will be. Think about the E, the events. What are the things I just listed? Fiscal, the fiscal cliff, China slowdown. These are big E's. Now, to use this equation and to manage your R well, there are four rules. The rules are important. First rule, always press pause before the R and after the E. So right before you're going to respond, press pause. Really make sure you understand the event before you respond. The second rule, the most important R's are related to the most difficult E's. All right, right now, and to summarize that, big E's take big R's. Who's got a big E sitting back at the office right now? You shouldn't even be here at breakfast because it's so big. I do. That's a big R. You've got to really spend time on that response. 
because it is going to determine how successful you are. Here's rule number three. Do not blame the E if the R is not working. Right? How many times do we do that? Our response didn't work. Guess what? Change the R. Last one. Rule number four. Do not let the pace of change of the E be faster than the pace of the change of your R. We can all think of some brand names, some recent companies that had great market share and now have none. We're on the verge. The E outpaced their R. That series of rules, that piece of advice is how we run our business at Grant Thornton. Our business is tied to your business. My challenge to you is to manage your R over the next year. My friend who gave me this piece of advice is an individual by the name of Tim Kite. He runs a group called Focus 3, and we've been working together for 10 plus years. He's a good consultant, great friend. We both see companies that are doing extremely well in responding to this, their R's with these E's in front of them. And what are they doing? And this is where I'll wrap it up. They've got three things that they're doing. They are investing in process, new process, innovation in new process and new product. They are investing in new market identification, new market penetration. It's formal processes inside their companies. They've got leadership driving new market penetration. And then finally, they're spending money on getting better information. I think we've got a great panel today. They're going to talk about some big R's, I'm sure, because they're all facing the same big E's that uh, we all are. So David, again, thank you very much. I'm going to turn it right back to you. Before we start our panel, there are just a handful of other guests I'd like to acknowledge before we start. First, the man who is responsible for the great journalism Cranes does every day online and every week in print, Crane's editor, Michael Arndt. And we're honored to be joined today by leaders from several association and advocate groups who every day champion the cause of manufacturing in Chicago and Illinois. All these executives have been valued partners as we plan today's event, so please join me in welcoming them. Brian McGuire, president of the TMA, Pam McDonough, who is president and CEO of Norbic and the Alliance of Illinois Manufacturing, Bruce Breaker, director of the Chicago Manufacturing Renaissance Council, Mike Holzer, director of economic development for the LEAD Council, and Julie Starziak, director of the Illinois Manufacturing Association. Thank you all for all your help in making today's event possible. Now, I'm honored to introduce our moderator, one of Chicago's very own. Dr. Don McNeely is an industrialist, professor, and economist. His opinions are widely quoted in the trade press, the Wall Street Journal, and yes, Cranes. He is most proud of the fact that he grew up on Chicago's west side in a large working class family. Don is president and CEO of Chicago Tube and Iron Company, and he's also an adjunct professor at Northwestern University's McCormick School of Engineering. Chicago Tube and Iron is a steel distribution and fabrication company headquartered in Chicago. The company recently completed its 98th consecutive profitable year, which is a record in the U.S. steel industry. In 2001, Don was the principal architect of a merger with his company with Olympic Steel. The combined companies have $1.5 billion in sales, 30 plants, and 2,000 employees, 350 of which are in Chicago. Don is a graduate of the Harvard Business School. He also attended the University of Wisconsin, Benedictine University, and George Williams College. That means he holds a bachelor's degree in business, a master's degree in business administration, and another in management and organizational behavior, and a doctorate in economics. So without further delay, I hand things over to Don McNeely, who will lead the discussion with our panel of leading manufacturing executives. Thank you. 
As I awoke this morning, it was somewhat different. I tried to discern what was different about this morning, and I was going to spend a couple of hours with kindred spirits. How often are you in an environment with people that get what you do each and every day? We live in a society, and this morning I will set aside political correctness, but let us divide society into the makers and the takers. How often is it that you are in an environment of makers? We leave a legacy for the next generation. The Bible says, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach him the fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. Is there any better legacy to leave the next generation than the means of employment, a manufacturing job? When you get to the end of your life, there's only one question that you will measure your life by. Was your existence relevant? Is society better because you are here? What I find in our research studies, by and large, if you're in manufacturing, that answer is almost an assured affirmative. But today, in that political correctness aside, there's an elephant in the corner of that room, and we're going to shove them right to the middle, that elephant right to the middle and address it. In all due respect, as comforted as I am being in this audience, you're the wrong audience. You get it. Today, we are preaching to the choir. We need to clean the room, clear the room out, <clears throat> and we need to fill it with journalists, and we need to fill it with the media, and we need to fill it with the policymakers that do not get it. They do not have the ability to connect the dots of what we do. We all have trade publications, and they do a good job. They exist on the advertising. But where is our voice outside of our trade publications? I travel the world, and I must tell you, Cranes, that magazine, that company is one of the few voices of manufacturing. And David and Amy, before we go further, we should acknowledge you for a job well done. Thank you for being our voice. <clears throat> In 19 months, my colleagues and I will celebrate our centennial, a feat that 99 out of every 100 business launches never achieves. Only one out of every 100 business launches can celebrate its centennial. Isn't that interesting? But there's an interesting phenomena. Of those that reach that centennial, manufacturing companies are disproportionately represented. So if you take one out of 100 and assign that a value of X, you know you have a professor behind the podium, the representation of manufacturing in the centurions is 6.5 times X. Why is that? We're not a glamorous industry. It's difficult to recruit to. You don't feature that celebrity industrialist on a TV show. We're boring. We're vanilla. Nobody flocks to us at the culinary or the cocktail party. Yet, when you're looking for financial sustainability, the ability to contribute to a society and create jobs, isn't it interesting that we all go to the Boring Manufacturing Center? So we are overrepresented when you look at who those are that we should worship, who can sustain a success. You know, we live in, in the best country in the entire world. If we're in this room, we're fortunate, we're blessed. Whether you were born here or your migration brought you here, it is indeed the best country. A lot of economists want to throw data point after data point, and I have only one this morning, if you'll bear with me. From the time Crane started to promote this event to today, the world population hit 7 billion people. That's happened in the last few weeks. We declared our independence from Great Britain in 1776, 236 years ago. In America, we have just over 300 million in our population. If I take that 300 million as the numerator and divide it by the denominator of the 7 billion, it's 0.04. So now let us connect those dots. With just 4% of the world's population in just 236 years of age, we are able to produce 25% of the world's output, and we have 30% 30, 30 of the world's net worth. Whenever there's a volcano or a tsunami or some natural disaster, who's the first country they're writing the check? We are. And in the world of public arena, it's never big enough, is it? But we were born in this great country. Now, why were we able to achieve those impressive numbers? Because in America, what made us great was the middle class. This resulted in a distribution of wealth, a standard of living in our nation went up beyond any others. The middle class was able to choose do this because why? Where was the middle class employed and deployed in high paying manufacturing jobs? You cannot increase the standard of living of a nation without a middle class. You can't have a middle class without manufacturing or industrial jobs. The manufacturing platform of a nation leads to increased wealth, elevated standard of living, home ownership, improved health care, a longer life, look at the mortality tables. Yes, manufacturing has contributed to that. If I move for a moment to the government, and it would be very easy to get on a soapbox, but I'd be redundant to what you've said from behind your podiums. 
But what is the first responsibility of a government? If we step back and pretend we're over a beer and simply connect the dots, the government needs to protect its citizens, especially in this day and age. How do you protect your borders without a military? How do you have a military without an arsenal? How do you have an arsenal without weapons? And how do you have weapons without a manufacturing sector? Are you going to offshore the manufacture of your weapons to your potential enemies? Who might they be? They might be everybody in the world right now. So we're not connecting the dots at the policy level as well. In terms of economic viability, each manufacturing job has a ripple effect. You've all heard that. One manufacturing job creates three to three and a half service sector jobs. Look where your plant is and now count the waitresses and the auto mechanics and the bankers in the bakery. Those all exist because of a manufacturing job. We talk about society going from an industrial base, we're dead, to a service sector. But what is ignored there is there's a mutual dependency. When you look at who's buying the services, who's doing the banking, who's hiring the consultants, who's buying the software, at the end of that channel of distribution, somebody's making something. There has to be a manufacturing sector. Yet the media would prefer to feature our failures as opposed to our successes, our plant closings as opposed to our plant openings, and our labor strikes as opposed to our labor accords. At Northwestern, I have the good fortune of teaching in their prestigious MEM program in the engineering school. Ten years ago, I'd asked the undergraduate students coming into the graduate program, what are you hearing at the graduate, undergraduate level about manufacturing? We're hearing it's dead, don't pursue a career, the Midwest is the Rust Belt professor. The last person to leave manufacturing, please turn out the lights. That's the impression that undergrads were entering grad school concerning our industry. Here's the sobering point. That was 10 years ago. Five years ago when I was posing the same question, there was an epic shift. And the answers were, manufacturing? What? We're hearing nothing. You see, there is an emotion worse than hate. When you hate something and you fight with somebody, something down there is worth fighting for. The emotion that's worse than hate is apathy when you hear nothing. Isn't that a shame? Now, if you connect that with my earlier criticism of much of the media, cranes accept it, you now understand the impression they get. What about the laws of supply and demand? If you see that the market has a demand for green widgets and you go back tomorrow and produce blue widgets, you go out of business. We need math and science skills. But the school system continues to produce a product for which there is no market for. Why? They have a monopoly. If you live within this zip code, you have a monopoly on education unless that consumer can pay for private education, which is increasingly expensive. Undergraduate degree, Northwestern University, quarter of a million. Let me round it for you. And by the way, talk about a captive monopolistic market. If your customer doesn't show up that morning and they happen to be under the age of 16, <clears throat> the police will go get them and deliver them to your factory, your classroom. Now, I don't know about you, but that does not describe my business. The interesting thing is we find that students today are choosing their major by the least amount of math. They're choosing their course by the least amount of reading. They're looking for courses that have 30 pages of reading or less. A class is 10 weeks long. 30 pages of reading is three pages a week. My goodness, look at the tripping points. So let me connect that for you. America this year will graduate 60,000 engineers. I'm on an engineering faculty. China will graduate 600,000. India will graduate 600,000. We will graduate 60,000 engineers to China and India's 1.2 million. 1.2 million. So as we pursue that process, we don't let them stay here. We send them back to compete against us. So as I close this morning and get to our panelists, who we want to hear from, I will tell you there's a shift in our country of what once made us great. And I know I'll be around to protect my daughters and be there for their counsel. But what's sobering is mathematically, I won't be here for the grandchildren. So how do you protect them? Through a trust fund? That's a prescription for disaster. But the beauty is we don't have to go this alone. We have people that have a successful track record that are willing to share it with you. And today we have four great panelists who are experts in manufacturing. They're familiar with the industrial landscape and they very generously agreed to share those insights today. To my left, and you have a full biography in the packet in front of you, is Tim Yonke. He's the president and the CEO of LK Companies they are a manufacturer of premium plumbing and cabinetry products for residential and commercial application. Prior to LK, Tim spent 21 years in leadership roles at Newell Rubbermaid. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim. Thank you. 
To Tim's left is Steve Kirsten, owner and president of third generation water saver faucet company and guardian equipment, worldwide manufacturer of faucets, valves, and related products. He's been based in Chicago for over six decades, a long way into his journey to his centennial. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Kirsten. <laughs> to Steve's left, we're fortunate to have Bruce Limitanen, chairman and CEO of Finko & Sons, formerly with U.S. Steel Corporation and Lockport Steel Fabricators. Bruce holds four U.S. patents in the treatment of molten steel and other operations. Bruce. <laughs> and to his left, our anchor is Linda McGill Bozeman, sole owner and president of Cedar Concepts Corporation. They are a processor of raw materials for Colgate, Sitco, P&G, Boeing, and other Fortune 50 companies. She holds technical and leadership positions as well as operation manager and partner. She's the first and only Afro-American woman-owned chemical manufacturing plant. Ladies and gentlemen, Linda Bozeman. I'd like to start this morning with one of the mold questions on our survey. What is Chicago and Illinois' reception to the manufacturing sector and how does it compare to what it was three or five years ago? Do you feel we are valued, appreciated, supported? Do they really get our value? Linda, would you like to start us off? Thank you, and thank you for having me this morning. Um, I'd actually like to go back a few years before three, the three to five years, and we look at manufacturing, if we go out back about 10 to 15 years, where we were clearly undervalued. Uh, it was not where we were sending our children for jobs. Um, the political climate around manufacturing was not really being focused on. And if we look at what happened 2008, 2009, clearly that changed. We, we saw the erosion of the middle class because we didn't have manufacturing. I find one of your um, statements earlier when you talked about um, India, because I actually um, ended up with my company by uh, starting out, um, and I need to tell you a little, a little bit about this story, working for a young lady from India. And she made a, a comment to me, and it never went out of my mind. She said, uh, you know, your people don't make anything. And that just really stood, stood with me. And as I progressed through college and had an opportunity to enter into the manufacturing realm, I just thought, you know, I want to make something. Um, if, as we go back to the question of whether, whether or not Chicago welcomes this climate, clearly it does now. Um, I had the opportunity to participate on a session with uh, Chancellor Lang um, and Dean Lott with the City Colleges Initiative to try to bring um, manufacturing ideas back to the City Colleges. I know um, particularly I participated with the Olive Harvey Initiative that will be dealing with logistics. Uh, I know they're going to roll out manufacturing at um, Daly College. So um, I think the city gets it. Um, you look at what just happened in um, Crane's article when Mayor Emanuel is talking about um, looking at the port. Look at the port in the city of Chicago. They just ran that article. You know, how can we make this va uh, a valuable tool for our city? Um, we talk about jobs. I I'm sure like uh, the other panelists that are here, um, the city of Chicago and other places have really taken a point to recognize manufacturing as to, to be the ground base for building the back the middle class in the city of Chicago. Um, They've got a lot of initiatives out there. Uh, for a company our size, for example, um, they mentioned Pam McDonald here from the Alliance for Illinois Manufacturers. We tap into those types of resources. They are, the city and the state, they offer a lot of initiatives that allow us to assist in training grants. Um, we're very proud to say that just the last month, the city of Chicago has actually uh, passed um, the, um, I'm not exactly sure what the word for it is, but we will be building a lead chemical manufacturing facility on the south side of Chicago. So the city gets it. I think the state is getting it. And it's just incumbent upon us to work with them and try to find more innovative ways to make this work. Bruce, you've been in the Chicago area a long time. Your comments? Yeah. Um, the question was the last three to five years compared to the past. Uh, and really commend you, of course, with your comments of the next generation. And that's what we're trying to do at Finkel. Uh, we've been in Chicago now over 130 years, believe it or not. 100 years at our site on the north side. And the misconception, and Cranes does get it, by the way. They do get that manufacturing is good. And we, we want to applaud that. You know, working with the city, we've had a phenomenal run on the north side, the planned manufacturing district. It's been a success to us. And now we're looking for the next step. And we're doing that. Uh, the city and the state do get it. 
in this last three to five years. Uh, we're building, we're not moving, we're building right now as we sit here a brand new steel plant, brand new. All of the hot metal, the melt shop, the forge shop, the heat treat, 100% is brand new, designed, engineered, and put in by people, our employees, and people in Chicago. So it's not just the working people that our employees will be moving, it's gonna building the equipment. It's just a world-class story. I'm an engineer by training. So that build out is taking place and we're building that plant for another 100 year run. We've been there 100 years, this is 100 years. And the new plant for the city, and really, really is exciting, it will be the class of the world, not world class, in a recycling forging industry, class of the world. Anybody talk to folks here today, welcome to come and see it. We could not and would not have done that to the question without city, past city and present city and state, both officials. Uh, we looked at all over, we looked at Ohio, we looked at Canada, we looked at, uh, you know, here. Fortunately, through the city and the state, we found a property that's been rejuvenated. It was a property, there were 1,200 employees at Verson, went bankrupt, that was closed. The buildings, the cranes, we were able to use them, finding that through the city and state and stepping up just in the last few years with the crash that took place, we've never gotten any support. We've gotten tremendous support from both the city and state. And we will have, by the end of 2013, a class of the world. It is just, so we couldn't say enough. And if it weren't, weren't for that, when the crash came, we found a, a, a place to move into in Canada. We moved it, would have moved to Quebec near a company we own in Canada. So, you know, I think, not only do I think they get it, but then we go to the education and the jobs. In the past two years, we've hired over 100 people. We're from 300 up to over 400 people today. Uh, we've got kids from virtually every one of the colleges down there. We hired over 35 kids this summer in our plant, helped us in the build out. So it's the city and state get it to answer the question, and we're excited to be on another 100 year run. Boy, it's excellent to hear some encouraging news <clears throat> from some of our policymakers. If you look at the Crane's uh, printout that's on your table, I want to move to this question. I think it's on the mind of all of us. You know, I missed one point, please. Please, go ahead. Um, and the beauty from the city standpoint, and mentioned it, our new plant is on the south side of Chicago. It's at 93rd and Stony Island. Uh, when I started at Finkel, the neighborhood was terrible. You couldn't walk across the street. Our employees would have a problem in the Clybourne Corridor, it was unsafe. Now you have one of the best areas in the city of sh Chicago, the north side of Lincoln Park. Our new plant is an area with 30% unemployment. It needs a lot, but the jobs, 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 and what was mentioned, the ripple down. We're using vendors in the community. Everything we can buy, we're buying in that community. We're using everything from buying the local supplies to the janitorial, to the food. Finkel will have the manufacturing, that ripple down effect, that's the point. When you look at this new PMD manufacturing in the south side, I may not be here, but everybody will see the, the long-term advent and upgrade of that community. So in an academic environment, we say there's your case study, there's the empirical evidence of that ripple effect we spoke of earlier. But as they talk in the back of my mind is where are they finding the talent? Where are they getting these people? Manufacturing with high performance strategies or growth initiatives are not so much encountering the typical barriers of desire or market opportunity or even capital formation, but rather a shortage of talent and skills. How will the shortage of talent and skills affect your company and its plans going forward, Tim? Well, um, they're impacting our business today. Um, I, would, I would tell you uh, two conversations that I've had within the, the last uh, two weeks uh, we were discussing plans for 2013 and, and uh, you know, it's typical budget season for a lot of companies out there and we were running through some numbers yesterday in, in our meeting room and I was told, I was a little confused by some projections on a, a new channel that we had entered, a, a food service channel uh, where we were offering products that were more traditional to other parts of uh, our business. And um, I was confused by the fact that we had been running at about a 25% growth this past year and suddenly the growth projection for next year was zero. Um, that caught my attention, as you can imagine. Um, and it was, a, it was a very simple look from my COO who looked at me and said, Tim, we're at max capacity. That's the number we can produce. And I said, well, we're running one shift. Uh, he said, Yes, we are, and that's what we can run right now because we can't find uh, employees. Um, these are not entry-level jobs. They're mid-level skill. I wouldn't say they're skilled labor. They're not 
Um, they're not tool and die, uh, you know, mechanical type jobs, but they are uh, skilled welding jobs. And um, uh, there's a, a whole series of, of uh, issues with that. One, we're not training, we're not developing, we're, we've eliminated virtually every apprenticeship program that ever existed in the area. And that's, I think that's something that uh, is a huge danger to manufacturing in, in Chicago. It's manufacturing in the United States. Um, so you know, it, it is an issue right now and it's impacting our business. It probably will cost us an opportunity to, to sell somewhere between five and $10 million worth of additional products that I have demand for that I can't produce. Uh, in addition, some other major type projects we've had to basically uh, factor out over a longer period of time from uh, a lack of engineering. Uh, you mentioned the, the data on, on engineering uh, graduates in the United States. Uh, I've seen those numbers before and, and it's terrifying. 60,000 engineers a year, uh, numbers 10 times greater in, in some other countries that are taking manufacturing jobs and, and other jobs that go with them. Uh, to their countries and, and with that goes the wealth of our country to, to other parts of the world. So I'm, um, you know, the, the, that's the E part of this, right? So what's the response, the R part of this? Well, um, you know, we have to do things internally. Uh, I think uh, apprenticeship programs, training, development, working with schools, making sure that um, those who are uh, graduating uh, with those engineering degrees are being attracted into companies like ours and, and into environments like like what we have. Um, we've um, we've been challenged in growth initiatives over the course of the last few years. We're in a, a mode right now of growth, uh, but it is one of the greatest limiting factors we have going into 2013 and beyond. It's not capital, as you mentioned, and it's it's not opportunity. It's it's having the proper people and the and the proper um, skilled labor that, that we need. And as Tim talks, it's not necessarily just engineering, but basic mechanical aptitude. And, and you know, kids aren't working in a gas station growing up. They're not growing up on a farm anymore. But let me have a trivial question. Anybody remember the Washburn Trade School? You know, who has filled that void? Steve, does any of this resonate with you? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and it's ironic that you mentioned the Washburn Trade School, um, because when my father started our business with his father, he came out of service in 1946. He was a graduate of the University of Chicago. They had this idea to start a company manufacturing faucets, so my father went to Washburn Trade School. And even though he was college educated, he learned to operate a lathe and a drill press, and he would go out and sell, and if he got an order, he would come back to the factory and, and make the faucets. So obviously, we've come a long way since then. Uh, as uh, Don had mentioned, we're a 65-year-old, third-generation company. Uh, but in many ways, we really are a microcosm of what all the manufacturers in this room or in this state or in this country must be facing. So much of what I was going to comment on has really been summarized uh, in this article that was on everybody's seat. Um, there are lots and lots of people out there looking for jobs, uh, but there, yet there's lots and lots of jobs that are going unfilled. Uh, so there seems to be this tremendous mismatch uh, between the people who are looking for jobs and the people that, that all of us in, in this room need. Um, like Tim, our jobs span the spectrum. Uh, all we have um, people in our factory who I would say are relatively in lo relatively low skilled positions, such as assemblers, testers, packers. Uh, we have sort of mid-skill mid level positions, uh, people who do polishing and buffing operations, uh, powder coating operations, uh, which require a certain amount of expertise all the way up to uh, skilled machinists, uh, CNC setup men and CNC programmers. Um, so we really, you know, we have lots of different slots that we need to try and fill. Um, at a minimum, everybody who comes in the door must be able to read and understand work instructions. They must be able to read and understand safety rules and regulations. They must be able to understand our product line. They must be able to keep track of what they're doing. They have to use a computer to follow the workflow and input data, and they have to be able to use measuring instruments. And those are not skills that the average person walking in the door is going to present with. Um, so it's been a very challenging, frustrating situation for us, and we've had to resort to a lot of self-help. Um, 
system. The first thing we did is, like Bruce's company, we faced uh, space constraints and space challenges, and we looked at all sorts of options for what we should do to address that, from expanding in the city, moving out to the suburbs. We ultimately decided to stay exactly where we were and expand and renovate. Uh, because I couldn't bear the thought of losing the people I already had. <laughs> so if you're challenging, you know, if you're struggling to get good people in the door, the last thing I wanted to do was run the risk of losing people that I had worked so hard to get. So we stayed in the city. Uh, like Bruce's experience, we found the city to be very supportive of our efforts. Um, but then we had to start to figure out how to address the skill shortage that we were seeing. Um, so uh, we did sort of a few things. We brought in um, ESL instructor. We had on-site ESL classes. Uh, we hired somebody to come in and do on-site training uh, for people working in our machine shop. Uh, but then we were approached a few years ago by the people who were organizing Austin Polytech Academy. So I'd, I'd like to comment for a minute about that. Um, Austin Polytech is a school on the west side of Chicago that's been in existence for five years. Um, the goal of the school is to train kids from the impoverished Austin neighborhood uh, for careers in manufacturing. And that can really mean anything from a college prep curriculum uh, leading to a career in engineering or in management or finance, all the way down to um, shop floor positions. So they asked us to become a corporate partner with the school. And I thought, my god, if we don't help these people, who's, who's going to? Um, so we did. Um, we funded the establishment of their, what they call the Manufacturing Technology Center, basically their machine shop. Um, I gave them the money to do that on two conditions. Number one, it has to be called the Water Saver Fawcett Company Center, so that everybody will know, <laughs> see our name. And number two, I get their best graduates. <laughs> so um, we also provide plant tours and internships, summer jobs for their students. Uh, we were approached just last year because of budgetary problems in Chicago public school system. The school funding for the school had been cut back to the point where they couldn't hire a guidance counselor. So they asked us to fund a guidance counselor position for one year, which I felt was critically important. You can't take these kids, give them this education, and then shove them out the door and say, figure out for yourself how to apply to college figure out where you're going to get a good education, navigate the financial aid process, go out and find a job with the manufacturing company, present yourself with a, you know, a well-put-together resume. It, it can't be done. So we had to step in um, and help with that. We tried to step in and help with that. But I would say relying on us, relying on private industry to do what the school system could be, should be doing is not a sustainable solution. Uh, the school system itself is going to have to step up and do it. Um, and I know that there's tremendous efforts being made to do that. Um, uh, there, Linda referenced um, the community colleges in Chicago. Daly College has been designated as the uh, focal point for training for careers in manufacturing. I see Ray Prendergast sitting over there who's doing yeoman's work trying to develop the curriculum and the programs to train these kids. So I guess my message would be just get involved. Um, I think the days of hanging up a help wanted sign and expecting qualified people to walk in the door are really over. And you're really going to have to, everybody's going to have to sort of uh, help pitch in to solve the problem. Amy and David had given me a list of questions that came from the audience. And this was the mode topic. So I want to stick with it for a bit. And Linda, reading about your background, I'd be surprised if you didn't have some input in this area. Well, clearly I do. Um, we um, recently partnered with a young lady. Her name was um, Jackie Lomax, and we uh, formed together with Jackie something called Girls for Science. Um, as I look at the panel, I see I'm the only female sitting up here. Uh, and when I looked at my growing up, you know, parents would tell you all the time, become a doctor. Actually, that's what I was going to do. I was going to be a doctor. But I hit something called cell biology and genetics, and I knew I was not going to be a doctor. <laughs> So my dad said, okay, well, you know, find something else you like. And I, I really liked physics um, because, you know, you would come into class, the professor would do this wonderful experiment. It was exciting. Um, and I also liked chemistry. The chemistry professors were really, really, they, they, they taught in a manner that made the chemistry real. So they wouldn't just put an equation or something up on the board. They would take this and relate it to something real life. So, you know, we say rotating hydrogen ions and then we say microwaves. And so I thought, 
we need to do something with these young people, and we need to do it now. So we took girls from the ages between 10 and 18, and we actually bring them into the city colleges with Girls for Science, and we work with them one-on-one. -on -one. So you, often you might find myself or anybody else that I can beg, any other females, and we take males too, to actually sit down with these girls one-on-one -on -one and teach them about the other types of sciences. They get it for the doctors, they get it for the dentists. The medical field has done a wonderful job of that, but when you leave the medical field, if you were to walk into my community, you'd be hard-pressed to find someone to give you 10 STEM fields to work in. And clearly, there are many others that you can do that. So it raised an awareness to me that we need to get out there and work with these young ladies. And the program started off um, with like maybe 20, and now we have over 300 girls going through the program. So I think just like you, you indicated, is we as manufacturers have had to find ways to join up with community partnerships and try to grow and have this next generation of young women coming through that can fill some of these positions. And see, I commend those efforts, and you've got to get over that emotional hurdle. Steve, what you're doing, in effect, is double taxation, because you're already paying tax to the school district. It's not producing what you need, so you're doing it yourself. And I think the cautionary message you give is it's not sustainable. You'll help in the interim, but eventually somebody needs to pick up this, this banner and take it forward. You're building a big plant, talk to us. <laughs> Well, and that's again the ripple down effect into the community. We've worked with schools on the north side, you know, for employees, but we're already working, you know, in the build phase with the two closest grade schools, already working. We have our employees going over there. Those grade schools, we're getting the kids to talk to them about manufacturing already to go to the high schools. We already have a female from the community that uh, graduated. Uh, we have scholarships now that we're funding at IIT to get kids out of the community to learn technical professions, and she's doing phenomenal in her second year at the university. Um, so it's, it's a continued ripple, as you mentioned, how businesses need to get, get involved. And the other thing that I think that the city gets that for our new plant, we've hired a master's with chemical out of Cornell. He's working on a new plant, moved to the city of Chicago, living downtown, just started. We hired an individual from Quinnipiac, a master's in economics, working at the new plant. And we've hired, we brought in 30 kids from Colorado School of Mines this summer. We've got three or four coming to work for us. So the other attraction of manufacturing locating around a major city like ours, you can attract some of the best talent from this country to come to Chicago and Illinois. That's great. And you know, you look at petroleum engineering, the number one starting salary out of engineering school is 85000 yeah. Never worked a day in your life. One out of every two petroleum engineering grads will earn over 85000 So we're looking for those basic math skills to start. I mean, just try this as a consumer. You ever go into a store and your bill's 1637 and you give them a 20 and they put 20 in so the register tells them how much change to give you and even spits out the coins? Do this. Wait next time when you're in there and your bill's 1637. Let them enter the amount tendered and then say, oh, I have two pennies. And watch the panic set upon their face <laughs> when it happens each and every day. Tim, talk to me a bit about uh, the, the world scene. Three years ago, there were two camps, those that offshore specifically to China and those that chose never to offshore to stay American-centric. There's now a third group emerging that are those that previously offshored that are now reshoring. Speak to that. Is that a trend that will continue? Um, I, I think that there's some significant opportunities. Um, now, every industry varies and, and every circumstance is different. I, I will tell a brief story about something that's going on with, with LK that is allowing us to, to bring jobs back into the U.S. and, and, and products that were being made um, offshore back to the U.S. Uh, back in March, uh, we filed an anti-dumping trade case against Chinese exporters of stainless steel sinks being exported into the United States. Now, this was a pretty dramatic action. Uh, but as you can imagine, over the course of the last five years, we produce products for the housing industry. Well, for those of you who may not have noticed, there's been a housing issue, um, <laughs> and, and volumes have been decreasing fairly significantly. Housing starts are, you know, had dropped to as little as about one-fifth of what they were just a few years prior. But during that same period of time, imported stainless steel sinks from China coming into the U.S. Uh, had increased by almost 50%. Uh, which is somewhat ironic. Uh, the more ironic part is that they were being sold for less than the cost of a piece of steel that's made into that. that. So we, we felt very comfortable that our, um, our activities were going to be uh, approved and, and, and move forward with, uh, with the SEC and the International Trade Commission. Uh, so we took this action. It was fairly expensive for us. 
Uh, but we did it to protect jobs here in the U.S., protect our industry, uh, protect our company, obviously, our employees, uh, and also the consumers and our customer base. Um, and, you know, one of the amazing things I've found as, as we have gone through this process is that our customers responded very favorably to the fact that we were taking an action to, to do something about uh, activities that were taking place offshore. So uh, during the course of this process, we've been successful to date. There's still one final ruling that takes place this spring. Uh, we're comfortable that we will uh, get a favorable ruling there, but everything has been uh, extremely favorable, and it has allowed us to, to bring back manufacturing. Uh, one of the first steps we did take upon filing this is with, we did produce some of our products for the U.S. market in a chi our Chinese facility uh, that was relatively small, but we discontinued that and moved it back in. We figured if we're, if we're making these claims, we need to make sure that, that our own house is, is clean and, and we you know, took those steps. Um, we believe that that will result in, in us producing about half a million more units of, of sinks this coming year, 2013, than, than in the past. That means probably in the neighborhood of about 100 to 150 jobs, and, and we can be very comfortable in, in that estimate. Um, so I think um, sitting back and just waiting, you know, again, I'm going to go back to uh, the, the conversation prior to, to us coming up here, you know, the event. The event was our, our market was declining. Uh, our competitor and a group of competitors in Asia were growing dramatically. They were being very aggressive, uh, and the force of that that uh, event caused us to take a, a fairly aggressive uh, response or reaction to it. Uh, but uh, the the strength of our response uh, and uh, the result that we're seeing is is very positive for again our company, our employees. Uh, our, our market that we participate in and, and ultimately our consumers and customers. And, and Tim, I'm impressed. All of us walk in tomorrow morning and have 80% of your business parked for four years. And notwithstanding that, mm -hmm. you not only survive, you continue to invest. You know, the elephant in the middle of the room just turned around and there's a big sign on the side of them, which is your second most popular question. The Illinois Workmen's Compensation Environment. <laughs> and, and Pam, I know you want to run up here and grab the microphone. You're an expert in this area. Steve, <laughs> let me kick it to you. You've got some experience with this, I understand. Uh, <laughs> I, I do, but if I could just digress for, for one moment uh, to the last question uh, and the re reshoring point, if, if I could Please. just comment on that. Uh, we haven't been impacted in the same way Tim's company has, but one of the things we've seen over the years is the decline of our supplier base uh, in the United States. The reshoring movement really uh, presents the potential for tremendous benefits for people who supply our company. Uh, I have a cheering section over there, a uh, company that we buy screw machine parts turned out for me. They came in this morning and they handed me a prototype, a first piece of a new part that we're making. It's actually for a line that we will be exporting. But having these guys here locally just can't be replaced. Um, to the can I, uh, I hold Workman's Comp. First of all, Bruce, make sure it's made out of steel. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's brass. Uh, but I'm going to come back to Workman's Comp. Bruce, yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't want to get, not get to Workman's Comp, but I'd like to comment, too, because this is just literally within the last few weeks, literally. Uh, we've had folks over from, this is interesting, very interesting, from Japan, Sumitomo, one of the biggest trading companies in the world. We have an order that we will get, and it's going to be selling dye steel to China for Japanese automakers. So steel made in Chicago through a Japanese trading house sold in China. We've had a whole contingent of Koreans here. GM is very big in Korea. We have a big relationship with GM and Ford. And we got a team going in a few weeks for next year's big buy at the front end in Korea, steel made in our new plant. And just this week I was working on BOPs. We were blowout preventers for the North Sea in the UK and we're making blowout peas. Now why is that important for the world? The U.S., our new plant can make a, a heat of steel in 42 minutes versus five and a half hours. And it's somebody sitting in an Atari game running a computer, not out on the floor. So our new plant growth is going to be in these overseas markets. That's really what I wanted to comment. And this is just like happening in these last few weeks. And, but it's been ongoing. We've got people all the time. If you're in this room and you're over 50, one day we woke up, we, we used to wake up in Chicago, go to work in Chicago, and sell only in Chicago. It is indeed global. Workman's Comp, Steve, lead us off, please. Uh, okay, well, I'm sure our experience is no different than anybody who has a manufacturing company where people have to pick something up, do something to it, and put it down someplace else. 
So if somebody is working, if people are working with their hands, their arms, their shoulders, lifting things, you're at risk. Uh, we don't do business in any, any manufacturing outside of Illinois, so I don't have a good basis of comparison. But everything I've read indicates that the situation here is much, much worse than it is in other states. Um, and I can tell you from our experience, it's a complete free-for-all. Um, I know there have been some attempts made at reform, uh, but they really haven't, to my knowledge, made a very significant impact on, on this, this system. Um, when we look down our list of costs that we can control, um, there's, very, there's nothing I can do about the price of brass. That's controlled by worldwide supply and demand. Uh, the price of energy, I can't do anything about it. Can, we can conserve as best we can. But workers' comp costs are a variable and unpredictable cost. Um, a back injury can cost anywhere from $100,000 to $400,000. Um, there's a huge incentive for the doctors who are treating people to treat an injury as a work-related injury uh, because they get higher rates um, if it's a work-related injury than if it's not. Um, if it, the law in Illinois is if an employee has a pre-existing condition, um, if the activity on the job contributes to it in a, even a minute way, we're 100 percent liable for the entire condition. Um, the craziest thing is that, you know, we try and do our due diligence. We uh, have our employees take pre-employment physicals uh, after we extend the job offer to try and make sure that they're physically able to do the job that we're hiring them to do. They can lie. They can misrepresent their position, uh, their condition, their past history, um, and we have no recourse. We're going through this right now where somebody claims they were injured. Uh, this woman had been operated on a year ago for the same hand that she claims has now been injured. She lied about it on her form. We can terminate her, but we're still liable for the injury and for disability payments. So it's really a, a terrible situation that really needs to be addressed in Illinois if we're going to stay competitive. I, I'll just add one thing because I can do a, a little bit of a comparison, Illinois versus other states. We have manufacturing in nine different states here in, in the U.S. and um, I won't. They won't duplicate any of the things. They're all the horror stories that we could all talk about. Without question, Illinois workers' comp laws are the most uh, adverse to, to maintaining manufacturing jobs of any of the nine states that we do business in, and it's by a factor of several. So it, it is, while there were improvements made over the last couple of years, it is still dramatically worse, and it, it will limit the number of manufacturing jobs and the growth of, of jobs here in Illinois if it's not addressed. And down, as you know, Pam, at the uh, Industrial Commission, we have the, uh, the Hall of Miracles. After they have the hearings that day, at night, we take all the walkers and the crutches out that were discarded after the award was given. <laughs> and we have the, you know, all the arbitrators, you know, Uncle Al, the working man's pal, but it's a burden that we have to deal with. Um, what I want to do is make sure that our, our, our manufacturing audience members do leave with some takeaways. And I, I think one of the questions that we all have is, here you are in the middle of this, or at the end of this protracted recession, we hope, and you're still not only surviving, but actually a very vibrant manufacturing environment. What strategic growth strategies have worked for you through this tough economic manufacturing environment? And how do you determine what opportunities you guys are going to focus on going forward? Tim, let me run this one from, from uh, left to right. Sure. Um, sometimes the simplest things work. Um, you know, lots of times when you're looking to, to drive new volume, to drive sales, you, you talk about new customers, right? Everybody goes, I got to go find that new customer. That's one of the most difficult things to do is get the new customer. One of the most um, uh, successful strategies that we've had over the course of the last few years is take that customer you're already doing business with, that you already have a successful relationship with, and sell them more stuff. Um, you know, whether it's more of the products that you do or find out what other things they need, what other services they need, focus on that. It, it, it is already, you know, to get in that door to develop the relationship is, is so much of the difficult part of the process and the time-consuming element. If they already have trust, if they already believe in you, if you've already developed that relationship over time, find other things that you can do for them. Um, the, other, the other piece is to take a look at, at your products and where else can they be um, uh, sold to. We, we found 
We have, um, you know, again, some of our products, stainless steel sinks. A lot of the, the stainless steel metal bending forming that we do, um, instead of just for residential and commercial environments, we started looking at hospitality and food service, and, and we found that we had products that our customer or, or new customers, different channels, wanted that, uh, to be honest, we never looked at before because we didn't, had, we didn't have the need to go looking outside our, our typical channels. So those are our two suggestions I would make. Steve, what's next for you, and how do you find it? Um, our response is almost exactly the same as Tim's. Uh, develop new products that have, uh, there might be opportunities for in the marketplace, and then take your product line and offer it to people uh, in new markets that you haven't been in before, which for us meant uh, international. Uh, so we had to uh, develop some new products for the international market, make metric threads, things of that sort. Uh, but that's how we, we, we started, we managed to keep our heads above water. We've been working with the goal toward the new plant uh, very, very hard in the energy sector, which is important to the United States and North America, we think. We're actually the largest maker, believe it or not, of frack pump blocks in North America, frack pump blocks, melted, forged, heat treated here in Chicago. And you heard products, we've developed new grades into that, that the pumps last that much longer. We see that as a growth business for us. And with a new plant, we can make bigger things. Instead of 100 ton, we can go up to 250 to 300 ton. We're not there yet, but we're on that path. We've made a lot of blowout preventers this year. Everybody heard about the problem in the Gulf. Well, in the world, you heard the UK, so we're starting to manufacture BOPs, blowout preventers, the big bodies at the new plant, which is really, really exciting, a growth strategy. Um, and you heard new products, and interesting, you heard stainless steel. Uh, I've got patents on the vacuum processing, but we're starting up within the next literally quarter of VOD, vacuum oxygen decarburization. So Finkel, well, for the first time in its 130 years, we did it 70 years, well, 50 years ago at our north side, but backed out of it just because we didn't have space, didn't have to do it. Now with our new plant, we're going back into that. So we'll be making our first heat of stainless, and our growth is in the stainless steel markets, and that is entirely against offshore stuff being imported from either Germany you know, Japan or areas in Europe. So new products, stainless steel. And then the biggest on top of all of that, as we mentioned earlier, is the world markets. We're targeting this new plant, the growth, you know, in the China, India, Brazil. Got a company, people going to Taiwan. So size range expansion of your incumbent product, new product, and new geographies. That is correct. We're, our new plant is five times the size. Not a percent, multiple of five. Capacity, 550,000 tons, five times. Um, bigger product than nobody in North America can do what we're doing, melt and forge, nobody. And uh, expanding the grades. And what I didn't mention in all of this, and our panelists mentioned it, you know, we, our technology is the highest in quality in the world. So we're at the top end price-wise, but we're making the best quality of what we do. And that's really due to the people, not the equipment. And it's the schools in Chicago, you know, we've got uh, people from Northwestern Workforce, we've got people from IIT, we've got about 10 people from DePaul that have all gone through internships and in we have our, we write our own software, we do our own computer system, have our own computer company. Uh, all our engineers design the equipment. We've hired people from University of, uh, our president is a U of C MBA. So it's a cross section of the best people with the hard working people that I think makes us Chicago competitive. The UFC guy passed the drug test? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's our rival. While Linda comments on what's next for her company, I'd like to go to the audience for some questions. So I don't know if we have microphones out there at Rover. So Linda, what's next for you and how are you finding it? Well, we're very excited too about the new plant that we're building. Um, a lot of what we sell goes into what we call personal care, I and I and the petroleum industry. So when we looked back at 2008, 2009 actually happened to be our best year. And we've seen our, uh, our company grow at least 10% every year from that. That's keeping our jobs here in the city of Chicago, here in the state of Illinois, and here in America. And a lot of what we make, uh, as, as he mentioned, for example, one of our customers was Colgate. Um, I was just at a conference two weeks ago where they indicated only 18% of what they sell was sold in North America. So that means we can, we can be competitive. We can make products and sell them to companies that will be sold globally. We just need to be innovative and think how we can do this and make this marketable and keep, it, keep these jobs in the city and in the state of Illinois. 
process efficiencies. You heard that from um, my colleague here. Um, we're um, delving into that very heavily right now. Um, how can we um, improve our processes? We didn't take on any new customers over, the, over those years. Um, so that was clearly through process efficiencies. Um, and we took that one step further. Not only did we talk to our customers, we asked our customers, would you mind introducing us to other people that could be potential customers? And so, for example, uh, P&G um, literally took us and said, hey, this is a great company in the city of Chicago. They've been doing good work for us. What can they do for you? And we opened that dialogue up. So we even used those type of avenues to help um, develop our businesses. So in the spirit of town hall, uh, let me kick it out to the audience. Sir, please lead us off. Hi, my name is Pete Kestrick with PNC Bank sixth largest bank in the United States. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess my question is for Bruce. Your new plant, union or non-union, and why? Yeah, good question. We're a union company. We've been union for, oh, I've been there 35 years. So it's been, I don't know, 70, 80 plus. Uh, we have uh, three unions, the machinists, the blacksmiths, and electricians. Uh, we work extremely well together, and, and much like Tim mentioned, uh, one of the drivers, the city and state were absolutely supportive as we went toward the new plant, but another advantage was the skilled workforce. We won't lose any of our employees at the new plant on the south side. So we're union. We work uh, well with them, um, and, you know, we're real excited, and all these people in the plant that we're hiring, they're all, they're all union people. We have the same thing that was mentioned. We have the ruler test. You got to do math. And that in itself is a challenge to just pass a ruler test. Now, that may sound crazy when math was mentioned. I mean, for the whole group to, to just do a ruler test is not the easiest thing. But you can't run a machine tool or work on our plant if you can't add simple fractions. So union plant, once we get them in, we have the same challenge. We have to train them. But they're head of household jobs, you know, full benefits, you know, medical, retirement, everything. And the growth, we're really excited to grow the plant at that location with the union workforce. Yeah. So we're, we're real, real excited. But I'll also mention we have to do the same training that was mentioned, just like everybody else. Because we're putting in brand new machine tools right now as we sit here starting them up. We're going down the food chain to do lights out manufacturing, full CNC. It'll be the best of this in the United States, making frack pump blocks. But... Getting machinists to run that is, I don't repeat what everybody heard earlier. Questions? Please. Now, we'll get you a good mic. Can we borrow your microphone over on this side, please, for a moment? See, his microphone wasn't manufactured in the U.S., was it? <laughs> if it was, it would work. That's actually true, but I won't, I won't say where it's made. Uh, anyway, my name is Brian Vrablick, and a, I run a company called the President's Forum. It's a think tank here in Chicago. We deal with some of the uh, most progressive and uh, best minds in, in Chicago. And I see a disconnect. Uh, we actually recently toured Northwestern's engineering department, and... Uh, I've got a good friend that uh, went to Northwestern. Now he's a uh, pretty high up manager with uh, 3M. And every year they do a job here on Northwestern's campus. And the companies that are there pitching the, the best and brightest uh, graduates are the, the Fortune 500 companies of the world, which is fine, except that I think that there's a lot of us in this room that are more middle market Chicago-based companies. But, but So the question is, the disconnect is between uh, you know, these graduating engineers don't hear about middle market companies as a viable career alternative. And it's a great space to play in, it's a great space to have a career in, but they primarily get pitched by Fortune 500. How can we bridge that gap so that middle market companies get a shot at the talent coming out of our best schools? Well, I, I guess it's coming to the panel. I, I, my quick question or comment would be, um, there's a reason I left the business school and went to manufacturing, or to the engineering school. You know, you hope that that classroom would be a fertile recruiting ground, but nobody in the MBA programs or in the business schools find manufacturing attraction, attractive. So you really need to move over to the, uh, to the engineering schools. And I think what we need to do at the university is get people like you behind the podium in the classroom. 
If somebody makes a payroll and you walk onto college campus, you're a rock star. There's instant credibility. As we say on the south side, street cred. If you make a payroll, you're a rock star at a graduate engineering school. Jim? I'll add, um, you know, one of our successful tactics is to talk about not, not necessarily our size as much as, as uh, our family orientation. The fact is we're a privately held company. We're uh, family owned, have been for 92 years. And I think talking about the things that a private company can do and what we don't have to do like public companies do, um, I think sometimes it allows us to talk about the environment we can create, the, the involvement. Um, you know, we've, we've done some things. We get our employees involved in, in different activities in the community. Uh, it's very important, especially for recent grads now. It's not just about the, the work that they're going to be doing, but it's the involvement in the community, the involvement in more of a social structure that, that is very important. And, and we've put a lot of efforts and energy into um, different activities. I, I will give you a really brief one. Uh, we have a plant in Savannah, Illinois, uh, out near the Mississippi River. And, and this past summer, we had a, a cleanup campaign where one day a group of about, well, it was almost a third of our workforce actually um, decided that they wanted to to uh, do some cleanup activities along the Mississippi River, and and uh, most of our office and some uh, factory employees went. Uh, we gave them paid time off to do it. Those types of activities mean a lot, and and while that may not sound like a, a recruiting technique, but the reality of it is in in, in today's world uh, with Generation Y uh, grads coming out engineering students or, or business students, whomever, uh, they, want, they want to participate in a, in a social culture, not just, not just have a job, not just get a paycheck. So we stress uh, family ownership. You know, we don't live and die by the quarter. Uh, we, we do what's right long term. We have a long history. Uh, we have strong values and, and, uh, and a strong employee culture. And, and we tend to be able to attract. Now, our other issue is we have uh, 13 different manufacturing facilities here in the U.S., and we're in small towns. Okay, now that becomes a little bit more difficult when you're trying to get somebody to move to Savannah, Illinois. Um, yeah. But uh, but you know what? You, you just have to you have to live by your culture and do the things that that are based upon your strengths. And I, I think you can attract the people that you need in your organization. Rest of the panel, how are you attracting this talent in the mid market? Well, we're we're a, a small mid sized company, and one of the th strengths that we can offer uh, a potential uh, employee is that the diversity of work that you will be able to do. You, you won't be sitting in a silo, single source to one task. We need you all over the place. We, we need you to help develop us, help us to get to that next level. So for a student that's coming out that really wants to have an opportunity to have a wide breadth and uh, potential to work in different areas, um, different fields, that's very attractive to a company like ours. And we, I'm sure we do the same thing to some of the other people on the panel. We try to offer a lot of social initiatives to go along with that um, to our employees to try to keep them engaged. Uh, and that seems to be working. We've, uh, everyone I mentioned earlier, these people that have come in and including the majority of our management team that's running a company today, almost every one of them worked in the summers as summer employees when they were in college. And these were from schools all over the country, but primarily Chicagoland area. So what we find found in our company that steel is, okay, it's kind of a bad word and people aren't attracted, but when you get, you know, we hire 30 to 35 kids every summer. You know, we've, our best, uh, best new young engineer is a female and uh, she worked summers for us, paid her way through school. So every one of the management team and every one of these new recruits has generally worked summers. And then manufacturing can be attracted because we talked about culture. They like to be with young people. They like to be innovative. They're as creative as whatever. So if we can get them for two summers, uh, we'll take 90% chance when a job, we, t we encourage them to go get job offers, but generally we will get everyone that we want to hire due to that program. And we know if they're good, by the way. Yeah. So internships, <laughs> internships. Internships, internships, internships. And we try to do the same thing in the union. The union contract, uh, they've allowed us to bring in each one of the unions. We bring in people on the floor that are not in the union. They allow us to do it. So then, you know, when they're graduating, they've seen what the environment's like so they can get a good union member, too. So we've got two answers to that. One is... You know, if we're competing against a Fortune 100 or Fortune 500 company, a young engineer, you're going to go sit in a cubicle somewhere. 
and be separated by layers and layers of management from the people who are making decisions in the organization. In a smaller organization, you're working directly for the management of the company, so you can have a much bigger impact. The other is location, location, and location. Uh, we are in the heart of the city. Uh, if you're coming out of college and you want to live in Wrigleyville and take public transportation to work, we're the place to come. And if there's a market, if there's an appetite for a mid-market job fair, we could do something through the university for that. Sir, you've been very patient. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Albert Lewis. I'm with Moraine Valley Community College. Uh, we also provide uh, manufacturing training over in the Southwest. My question is, how can we do a better job as educators in partnering with industry to take this message into the high schools and even into the middle schools and grade schools about the great, this great thing called manufacturing? <laughs> I'll go, but go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, <laughs> I've been talking a lot. We're all jumping on this one. You know, it, it, it's, uh, I, I think it's just knowing what's out there, that you're there, that the, the activities that you've got going, communicating with us, we can communicate with you the types of things that, that we have a need for. Um, it, it, it's something as simple as that. I, you know, it, communication in today's world, you would think with all the social media, with all the different possibilities and so on that, that exist out there, that communication should be the easiest issue we can address tends to be the hardest because there's so much noise out there. There's so many, so many different stories, so many, you know, everybody's got a pitch. Everything is, is you, know, one, you know, 10 miles wide and one inch deep. There's no, there's no substance to it, but you, know, you, you weed through all that. Um, you know, personally, I, you know, we should know what you're doing, and I don't know that we do as a company know the types of things that you've got going on in, in your uh, in your environment and, and the types of students that you might have available that could be addressing some of our issues. So um, I would say get out there. We got, we got to figure out ways to, to be communicating directly so you know what we have and, and we know what you have. And I have a feeling that we need each other. So, so advice for this gentleman. That's the next wave of employment. He's with them every yeah. day. What, what does he need to know? Anyway. There's jobs out there. I, I, there's jobs right now today. I would suggest you're doing a disservice if you don't leave here today without a pocket full of business cards. <laughs> because I would describe the audience to you. One, very generous. They'll write a check when you need something funded that you can't get through a community college budget. Number two, get these people in your classroom. We've got an obligation too. Yes. You know, 23 million Americans are out there un unemployed today. 13 million actually want to work. We've got to close the skill gap. We've got an obligation to get into your classroom. Third, plant tours. We'll even pay for the bus. Put them on the bus and bring them out. And we'll give them plant tours. But walk out of here today with a, with a, a pocket full of cards. So you got a, and that was quick. That was quick. Quicker than an insurance broker. That's good. <laughs> Who would like the last question? Yep. Well, over here, I'll please. comment on that. And I've already got the two Moraine cards. We're doing our job. <laughs> um, but it, it was said right there. It's it's tours. It's internships. We have to do more too. Everybody on this panel, as you said. But the kids, the kids, and I say including my own kid, the kids just don't know, not that they're bad people, they, they've got information overload, right? They know more about everything, but they just don't understand what manufacturing is. So something as simple as a tour can make a huge difference at, oh, there are jobs. That, okay. If I, could I just make one, Stephen, we'll one comment? I was at a seminar recently where they talked about Project Lead the Way. Um, I don't know how many people here are familiar with this, but it's a phenomenal program. It's a curriculum that is uh, used in middle schools and high schools to prepare kids for careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. It started 15 years ago in 12 schools. It's now in 4,700 schools. The data indicates that it's really successful in getting kids interested in careers in engineering and manufacturing, and uh, it pushes these kids to go to college and to finish college. Yeah. Whatever happened to the old wood shop, metal shop, auto shop, remember that? Then you go to Hawaii and that's how they say hi and it reminds you of your high school shop teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm from South Suburban College. And I've been holding the microphone for a while, so it's interesting that the trend has been the same direction as what I was going to say. Um, the first question was about attracting students to the manufacturing field. What we often hear from companies is that because of insurance and safety issues, tours are not possible. 
And when we talk about internships, what we often hear are that the union will be all over that idea. So to some extent, you've been addressing it, but maybe you have something further to say about it? Well, I know we, are, we also are a union facility, and the union does support us having interns in our facility. I think perhaps what we need to better do is perhaps connect with some of these schools that are out here. Um, as a, a small, mid-sized company right now, we have about 10% openings within our own company that we're unable to fill. And I can imagine that this is, is carried downstream from the panel also. The other thing is somehow uh, we need to refocus manufacturing and how it is perceived by the public. Um, I, I, if, if your mother and father are telling you not to pursue careers in manufacturing, but instead go get an MBA so you can be the CEO of the next Fortune 50 corporation, what we need to somehow do is to make manufacturing, and I'm, yes, I'm the female on the staff, I'm gonna say glamorous, to let them know, I, you know, I think manufacturing is phenomenal. I love being in manufacturing. I love making something. I like at the end of the day, that we, our staff can say, you know, this is something we accomplished, we can look at it, we made it, it was here in the US of A, in the city of Chicago. So I think if we take all of that and focus it together, we need to somehow get, get them more directed into manufacturing. And that, that doesn't only stem from just manufacturing, but going back to those STEM subjects. It's how we teach them in the schools. We need to teach it so that it's, it's, it's exciting. In our Girls for Science program, one of the things we do is we say, when you come in there, when you talk to our girls, you're going to have our girls sequestered for two to four hours. You, they need to be having fun. We, you know, uh, and I think it's, it's a broad brush. You know, for every Kenneth Lay and Bernard Evers and uh, Dennis Kozlowski that go to jail and cast dispersions and all business people and our, our voice doesn't get heard, but we certainly outnumber them. But I think if your parents work for a large manufacturer that were one of these 10,000 layoffs, they're going to have a negative impression of manufacturing. We've got to find a way to distinguish that mid-market from the, those big student body right, student body left. Bruce. Yeah, the way we approached it with the union, which has been a long time now, is uh, originally we had those same fights you're talking about, absolutely, and our approach is mine has been to work with the union. So what, what they agreed to is we bring in the summer help. It's actually at a very high rate. It's at the minimum starting of the union entry. So we're paying more than we typically would for a summer person, a, way, a lot, lot more. Uh, lets the kid earn money you know, to go to school in a summer, summer job. But that accommodation to the union has proven many, many dividends for us to get employees. So that's how we broke through that. It was definitely like this for a long time, but it has not been for the last 10, 12 years. That's one and two on the safety. What we've done, again, for this whole program is we take our department heads, the people who run, and we've really the top people to give the tour. So therefore, we were the same way, that okay, we didn't want people to come in you know, we were on the north side. We needed. We were either going to be insular and close our doors or open our doors up. So we took an active program that we, we bring grade school, not just high school. We bring grade schools to our old plant, and we'll bring grade schools to our new plant. We just are very cautious. We just look at what we do. And so it, it's just been a, a proactive approach that we feel we've got to educate. That's, that's really what, what kind of we've done. Uh, please hold tight. Just give us two more minutes because I want you to hear the closing comments of our publisher. But first, let us recognize our great panelists and their generosity. <laughs> Linda raised diversity earlier. Um, I want to tell you, 10 years ago in an uh, engineering class, we would have three women out of 25. Today, our attendance is 30 to 40%. 25% of our panelists are female. If you look up at the audience, quick survey, about 35% of you, not where it needs to be, but very encouraging. So I make that observation as the father of daughters, the grandfather of granddaughters, and the brother of sisters. I think what this morning showed us is a breakfast isn't enough. The space is wide open. Ladies and gentlemen, David Snyder, thank you for this great morning. Thank you. Again, one final round of applause to our thought-provoking panel, Bruce, St Linda, Stephen, Tim, and our excellent moderator, and a great crowd that had great questions. Again, please join me in thanking our sponsors one more time for this, making this morning possible. MB Financial, Prescient Solutions, Shepherd Moscow, and our presenting sponsor, Grant Thornton.